Good morning. morning. 10 more minutes would be afternoon. So good morning. Um, Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for who you are, Lord. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace, Lord. We thank you for the man of love you bestowed upon us that you call us your sons and your daughters, Lord. Um, We know you love us, Lord. We know, Lord, you have a plan for our lives far greater than ours, Lord. Thank you for the body of Christ, Lord. Uh, Lord, we are a family, Lord, the family of God, Lord. No higher call than anything else in the world, Lord, to be a born-again believer. And so, Lord, we thank you for the blood of Christ that continually cleanses us, Lord. We pray, Lord, that your word today would be magnified and exalted even above your name. You said your word is settled in heaven. Let it settle in our hearts, Lord. You said with two or three are gathered in your name, you're in the midst. You're the central theme of why we gather. And so, Jesus, we love you. We love you, dear Jesus. So, Father, I pray, Lord, as David said, let the words in my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer, I do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I'm the senior pastor of Calvary Chapel of North Philadelphia. Um, We've been in existence about eight years. Um, Real mission-driven type of church, but inner city mission-driven church. Um, We service needy people. I mean, 80 percent, I think it's 70 percent maybe, of our attendees or parishioners or or whatever you want to, congregants, they're homeless. Another percentage is low income, and then you have maybe 10 percent is the working class people. But the majority of the people we service are actually homeless people. Uh, We have access now to 88,000 people they've given us to reach, outreach, whatever way, by any means necessary. We don't know what we're doing, but um, we'll die trying to figure it out. <clears throat> so the Lord has placed us in the fishbowl of uh, um, hundreds of people. And you know, you live in a city, you might be in a certain radius of about three blocks, and it could be 2,000 people live there because of high rises and things. You know, you can get one building, you got almost, you know, 700 people live in one building. So. We are so privileged, and I'm so glad to be here today. I have a great time, and I hope we have a great time as we continue. Um, So if you have a Bible this morning, let's turn to the book of Romans this morning. Romans chapter 12. Paul, the apostle, writes, Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, we'll look at this morning. And he writes, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. <clears throat> I love this letter. Paul is the person who's behind this wonderful letter we have called the Book of Romans. He didn't write it, he narrated it. He write, um, Tertius, who was the stenographer, the writer of this letter in uh, Romans 16, 20, he's the one that did the penmanship, but Paul, through the work of the Holy Spirit, is the one who narrates to him as he writes. Um, Phoebe, you know, uh, from Centria, she delivered the letter. So you got three people involved with this letter that was given to the church in Rome. Rome, the largest city in the world in the first century. And so Paul's writing to this church, and I love it because the book of Romans takes us as on a journey as a Christian. If you're a Christian, you love the book of Romans. You know, from Romans chapter one, verse one, to Romans five, 11, is the righteousness of a God revealed through faith, and in the blood of Jesus Christ, which justifies the guilty sinner, which is you and I. You know, we came to Jesus Christ by faith. We're no longer guilty sinners. We're justified. You know, as one commentary said, just if though we've never sinned. So we're justified. I'm glad about that. And then when you read Romans chapter 5, 12, verse 12 through Romans 8, 39, it's the righteousness of God is revealed through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it sanctifies the Christian for Christ to use us despite 
the sin principle that lives within us. You know, there's a sin principle that lives in, in all of us. And Paul spells that out in Romans chapter 7. And so in Romans chapter 9 through 11, we have sort of like a parenthesis in the book. And it deals with Israel's past, present, and future. And God is not done with Israel. He is not done with Israel, nor will he be done with Israel. And we're so wonderful, you know, we're so wonderful to know that, you know, he has a plan for the nation of Israel. And, and Paul makes that known through the book of Romans. And when you get to chapter 12, I think everything changes for us. Because now in chapter 12, verses 1 through Romans 15, 14, the righteousness of God is revealed in the transformed life of the believer. That Christ wants to live his life through our lives. That when we came to Christ, you know, I don't know, I didn't, you know, we got drafted. I really didn't volunteer. It doesn't seem like I did. It just seemed like God, you know, I got saved in the club on Delaware Avenue in Philadelphia. I would never forget. It was like yesterday, October the 4th, 1996. <clears throat> I was in a club on the dance floor. And I don't know how to dance. I don't know I was on the dance floor. But I get saved at this club, and I'm walking, and it's like, this your last night out, buddy. And, and it was. You know, I look, back, I look back now, and every day seemed like that first day to me. Every day seemed like that first day. It seemed like I just got saved. Because I remember it as such a clear, vivid picture of what God, you know, did in my heart, changed my life. And I said, I'll follow you, Lord, the rest of my life. And I've been following the rest of my life. It's been 17 years plus now. So I've been following the Lord. And, and Paul speaks of a sacrificed life, a life that is unto the Lord, you know, a life that when, you know, you live for Jesus Christ, <clears throat> it looks nothing like the world. To live as Christ does gain, it looks nothing like the world. And so this transformed life of ours is a life that God can make known to a dark world. He can use our lives as lives that can turn the world upside down. Remember when they said that these are unlearned and untrained men who had been with Jesus, speaking of the, um, James and Peter and the, and, the, and the disciples. And they had the untrained, unlearned part right, but they said had been with Jesus. They still was with Jesus. That's why they were able to do the things that they were doing. You know, so as we go through this this morning, I really hope that the Lord can show us that he can use your life. From the youngest to the eldest, he can use your life in such a unique way. And I'm glad about that. Because you think about the writer, Paul, who narrated this, he was a Pharisee. Paul was a Pharisee, so he understood sacrifice. He knew about the sacrificial system. He would have known the first five books of the Bible by heart. You know, he would have known he was a Pharisee of Pharisees and so forth. So Paul would have known everything about sacrifice. And in fact, Paul was the first century Ben Laden, you know, dragging Christians off and, you know, you know, almost making them blaspheme the name of Christ. And so for him to write this, to me, it makes sense that God will use this man who was sold out for Jesus. I don't think Paul left any stones unturned in his life. And ultimately, he would die and be beheaded. But he didn't leave any stones unturned in this life. I don't want to leave any stones unturned in my life. When I stand before the Lord, I just want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful of only a few things. Now I'll make you ruler of many, enter into the joy of the Lord. That's all I want to hear. I don't want to hear nothing about you should have been doing this. No, I don't want to hear that. So when I stand before the Lord, I want to be a living sacrifice. And Paul is talking about being a living sacrifice through surrender, that we could surrender our wills to Jesus Christ. You know, when they sacrificed those animals in the Old Testament, the animal was put to death first, then sacrificed. You know, they cut the throat, you know, the worshiper would put their hand around it, you know, and then cut the throat of the animal. And just imagine the life going out this animal. And then they put the animal on the altar to be ultimately sacrificed. He's not talking about a dead sacrifice. He's talking about a living sacrifice. Because we have the life of Christ living through us as born again believers. And so Paul says in verse 1, I beseech you. 
<clears throat> I like that. He says, I beseech you, para kelio is the word here, to call beside or to exhort and encourage. NIV says, I urge you. You know, I urge you. Um, the Young's um, translation says, I call upon you. Where the English translation says, I appeal to you. So if you're a Christian, this call is for you. He says, look, I urge you. I call upon you. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren. And you know the word brother, Philadelphia. I'm from, I grew up in Philadelphia. Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. Is anything but the city of brotherly love. <laughs> you know, and when, you know, we grew up, Philos, you know, you get Philos, and you get Philos is lover, Delphus is brother, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Here, the word brethren is the Greek word Delphus, where we get the word Delph, Adelphus, we get the word Delphus from this, which means the wound. That all of us were born from the same spiritual wound. That all of us have the same spiritual DNA. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. So if you don't like one another here, bad, tough luck. Because when we get to heaven, we're going to all be together anyway. Get on your side of the bed. You know, you don't wake up and be in heaven with the person you're arguing with. And he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, the family of God is calling all of us to this call here. By the mercies of God. You know, he says the mercies of God is the word that means compassion, the pity, you know, deep feeling about someone's difficulty or misfortune. God has a compassion for us, a, a deep love for each one of us. Each one of us, he loves us and he shows it through us, you know, in the cross. And he laid on his life for us, that he loves us. You know, Paul says that, you know, this passion, you know, he could have said that, you know, br brethren, by the, you know, demands of God. He says, by the mercies of God. Not by the demands or the somebody beating you over the head, so you better do it this way. That's not how the, God, how the God of the Bible calls us. He doesn't demand us. He loves us as a gentle shepherd who leads his flock. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies, you know, as a father pity of his son, so does the Lord pity those who fear him. You know, and every morning we wake up, you know what we have? A batch of new mercies. His mercies are new every morning, and he loads us daily with benefits. So he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, a compassionate, loving, gracious father. He's not making these Romans do anything. And look, it is the goodness of God and his mercies that persuades us and, and influences us to serve him. He didn't want none of, none of us serving him and say, oh, man, I don't serve this Lord. It's like a, a woman fixing her husband breakfast. You can say, here, honey, here's your breakfast, sweetie. Or you can say, here's your breakfast. <laughs> Low down scoundrel. You know, we, you could do that. But God doesn't do that. He loves us. He gently loves us. And it's his goodness. You know, we are beseeched by God, and then we are besieged by God. He calls us and beckons us to himself, and then he influences us, and he, and he wants to control us in such a way where it is a control that he has control of us because we voluntarily laid on our lives for him to have control of our lives. And I want him to have control of my life. You know, a few Sundays ago, me and my son was coming from a prayer meeting. He's 18 years old, so he drives now. You know, he's wanting to drive. And, and I'm like, oh, boy, Lord, what do we get ourselves into? And, and he says, Dad, I want to drive home. I was like, no, please, Lord, let this cup pass me, Father, please. <laughs> he said, no, I want to drive. I want to drive. I'm like, all right. And he wore me down. I was tired anyway. I said, all right, you can drive. And as he's driving, I'm like, ah, ah, you know. And I'm braking, and I'm on the other side of the car. You know, I'm like, ah, you know, you're putting on brakes. And I'm looking at him like, Lord, please, Lord, don't let him get in. Don't let him drive this car ever again, Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, please. And that makes you want to rush and get them a car, too, when you're driving with them. You know, and I think sometime in our lives, you know, God wants to hold steering wheel. And we're like on the other side saying, no, no, Lord, uh, not that part, no. Yeah, and you can have this. And, and when we grab the steering wheel, you know what we hear all the time over and over in the back of our mind? Recalculating, 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 recalculating. Because we always go off course, and he said, no, let me drive it. 
Let me have it. Let me have you. I want to beseech and beseech you. He says, so there, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. You know, I often wonder why he said bodies. And you may wonder why that too. He says, that you present your bodies. You know, he could have said you present your heart. You present your mind. You present your thoughts. You know, I, that sounds pretty reasonable to me. you like, Paul, come on now. Why do you say your bodies? Because, you know, I think of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, when it says that your bodies is the temple of God, where the Holy Spirit indwells. The Holy Spirit lives within the life of the believer. And he says, no, if I have your body, you know what I can do? I can help you with your life. I can help you with yourself. You know, he says, that you present your bodies because God wants our bodies to be yielded to him. He, he wants to, you know, he wants to, you know, he wants to have our eyes. You know, he wants to say, what are you looking at? You know, you know, Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon the maidservant? He wants to watch what we watch on TV. You know, you're looking at TV. Can the Lord sit next to you? Or he said, come on, not this one, Lord. Can't look at this one. <laughs> Please. And he wants to, you know, he wants our mouths, what we say and how we say it and when we say it. He wants, you know, our feet. Where do we go and how we manage our time? He said, oh, I serve the Lord. He said, oh, no, it's a sale at Macy's. They had a women, what? No, no, in Macy's, it's 50% off and you get your coupon. You know. I call those coupons the devil. You know those little coupons? <laughs> They are. They're just little devils. They come to your house and say, buy something. They have a, the fathers they sell. The mothers they sell. The, the, you know, they have a sale for everything. You know, Columbus they sell. Then Martin Luther King. You know, every day is a sale at Macy's. And they send you those little cards and you get them to go shopping. And you're like, oh, they got something going on at the church. I'm not going to that church. Macy's having a sale. And then they go so far, you know, the world has gone so out of their minds that you don't, Thanksgiving don't even exist no more. Straight to Christmas. You say, we want some Thanksgiving decoration. We don't have Thanksgiving. There we go, it's Christmas, straight to Christmas. And we don't want to call it Christmas, but the holidays. The world has lost its mind. And sometimes we can get caught up in it. And the Lord said, present your bodies, your whole life, that he wants your life. That your life is his life. That, Lord, whatever you want, I want. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it, Lord. I'm ready. Because I know you love me. I know you know what's best for me. Can I date that guy right there? No. Can I date that girl? No, you can't have that girl. She's going to be trouble the rest of your life. I remember when I first got saved, I used to say, Lord... Well, I don't have this problem now because I haven't had a haircut in years. <laughs> but I would say, Lord, can I get a haircut? Lord, can I wear this kind of pants? Did this look appropriate? Lord, can I go to this place? Lord, what should I do? Should... And some of us know exactly what I'm talking about. That when we first got saved, we asked the Lord everything. Lord, is, can, I, can I talk to this person? Lord, is it right? Lord, should I hang up now while they're on the phone still gossiping? Lord, I don't want to hear it. I'm not going to respond. I'm just going to say, oh, you know, I really need to go right now. You know, all those things. We, we didn't think anybody was bad when we first got saved. We didn't know how to gossip. You see anybody, you say, oh, praise the Lord. We're in the body of Christ. We love everybody. And witnessing, I would witness to a tree. Yeah, really? You've never been born again? Oak? You know, I would witness to a pond, anything. You wanted to tell everybody about this new love that you experienced. It's almost like a girl meeting a guy. She meet him. You know, you ever meet somebody, you talk on the phone with them. Till four in the morning. And y'all not talking about nothing. Y'all just still, you still there breathing? Yeah, I'm still here breathing. <laughs> And go right up and go to work and be tired and so you don't know what. And you're walking in. Where was you at all night? Oh, I was just on the phone. <laughs> we can sacrifice all of our time for ourselves and do things that we enjoy. And I think we should do things we enjoy. But I think the Lord should be first. That he should be first. He should be first. Because he says that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That we are a living sacrifice. The Old Testament, when they killed those innocent animals, the flesh was dead, the life was in the blood. And because Christ shed his blood for us, we have life. That we have life. 
And it's so important that we know that God won our lives conformed to him. The goal is not just heaven. It's just those he foreknew, he also predestined to be in the image of his son. In Romans 8, 29, that God's goal is conformity, not just heaven. And I think that, you know, when we start looking at our lives, you know, he won our lives set us up because he says this. He says, holy, that's the word hagios, means set apart, that your life is set apart. That our lives, you know, the word holy is the same word for the word saint, hagios. You know, none of us wake up in the morning. I never wake up and say, hey, I'm Saint Mark. You know, we don't wake up and do that. But God calls us saints and holy. That means our lives are set apart from the world. That our, all our whole lives are set apart from the world we live in. He says, holy, acceptable, that means well-pleasing or fully agreeable to God. Not to man. He says, to God. After these things, you know, Paul said, we can't even boast about them. So if we followed everything, that he says, look, okay, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. He says, you don't have anything to brag about if you do those things. Because he says, which is your reasonable service. Your reasonable service. And it makes sense to live for the Lord. We gain everything by putting our life in the hand of the Lord. Everything by putting our life in the hand of the Lord. And this is the logical choice that all of us could make and practice, that we can put our hands in the life of the Lord. That your whole life, you take a bond servant. Well, you know, Paul starts this let off in Romans 1, 1, and Philippians, and in Titus, he says that he was a bond servant. Bond servant, if you ask the bond servant, what are you eating today? You know what he would tell you? Whatever the master's providing. If you ask the bond servant, what are you going to do to wish your plans? I don't have any plans, whatever the master plans are. If you ask the bond servant, what are you putting on today? I don't know, whatever the master provides for me to put on. That our lives would be governed by God in that way. That, Lord, whatever you want, that's what I want. Whatever you don't want, that's what I don't want. And Paul says, look, which is your reasonable service? In other words, serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with singing. Serve the Lord. Be glad to serve the Lord because life is but a vapor. I get up on Sunday mornings at my church. It's, it's filled with people. Most of them are homeless people with needs we could never meet. We could never meet those needs. I mean, I look up and say, Lord, thank God you can meet those needs because I sure know we could never meet those needs. And I look up there and I say, Lord, what a privilege you've given me to serve. What a privilege. Because these people walk through the doors, they can't give us nothing in return. Nothing. The only thing we can do is serve them. I think it's the greatest thing we can do is serve them, but serve them. And imagine walking into a place, and we have altar calls sometime. They are it's from that wall to that wall with people coming to the Lord. All kinds of people. But, but they kind of, I got to warn you, they kind of weird altar calls. Because we had one guy come moonwalking backwards to the altar. <laughs> He's going backwards, walking backwards, moonwalking. And then when one of the elders told him to turn around, you know, he pulled out a big spray bottle and started spraying water. This is in the middle of the altar call. <laughs> you know, or we had one woman. We did an altar call. I'm, I'm leading people to Christ. She comes and stands this close to me and says, I'm doing the altar call. I said, no, I'm doing the altar call. She said, no, 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 buddy, I'm doing the altar call. <laughs> I remember one outreach we were at. I, I'll never forget this. We were at this outreach, and the, the whole time I was sharing, this guy was in the audience like this. He said he was going to get me. I said, well, why did you do that the whole time? He said, I don't know. I just felt like having fun. I said, well, okay, excuse me. <laughs> you know, these are the people we minister to. You know, prior to being a pastor, I used to be a mental health director. And, you know, and he, think of God's, you know, <laughs> God's humor. You know, he said, what do you do for a living? I run a mental health program. You still run a mental health program, you know. But I'm so happy that the Lord allows me to serve. It's, it's a reasonable service. I have nothing to brag about. Every mission field is different. You, you guys got a mission field here. It's a mission field in Philly. It's just different mission fields, and some mission fields are more needier than others. You know, it's just different mission fields. It's a different 
you know, ball of wax, but God still uses the body of Christ to minister in these dark places. I mean, they are dark places, too. We were in the projects once, and never forget this. It was 105 degrees, easily indoors. And you talking about roaches? Yeah, I ain't seen no roaches. These roaches was faster than Barry Sanders. They could run. They was weaving us. You couldn't even kill them. They must have knew how to survive. And it was just funny. But he says, look, that this is our reasonable service to serve, to serve one another in a body, and to be a light into a dark, degenerating world, a hopeless world. And he says, you want to know God's will? You can start putting it in motion when we get to verse 2. It says, and do not, this is instruction on it and admonition. And I think most certainly it could be looked upon as Paul is making a charge on a pill. He's pleading. He says, do not be conformed to this world. He says, don't be conformed to this world. This, don't, in other words, says, don't fashion your life to this world. This world is always changing. You know, one week is, this is out. iPads, iPhones, you know, Twitter, you know, MySpace. That's no good. That's old-fashioned now. You know, and you know, the next thing is this. And, and he says, don't be conformed to this world. He says, don't be conformed to this world. Because the world is always changing. Don't fashion your life after this world. Paul wrote to church in Colossae, and he said this. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on this earth. You know, because the world will draft you in. He says, be ye not conformed to this world system or the world's methods or the world cares, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and so forth that choke the word. He says, don't be a part of that because your life will never be a sacrifice, sacrificial life. You will never learn how to live verse one out. You know, you think about sometime when children come home, you know, and you say, okay, what's for dinner, mom? You say, um... Liver and onions. I'm not hungry. <laughs> Thank you. You know, and here Paul says, look, and do not be conformed to this world. Don't love this world. Don't love this world. Love God's method. And if you're young here today and you under the age of 20, don't love this world. There's nothing out there. I think the worst part of my life I can think of being young. We grew up going to church. Went to a Methodist church when I was a kid, from a baby to the age of about 15. And we, I was a singer. I used to be a professional singer. I used to be in the music. And once I figured out how to get out of singing in the church and started singing for the devil, my life went down to, it just went downhill. It just started going downhill. I got out of the church and said, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. And from the age of 15 to about the age of 33, I just live like the devil. Life was a mess. Nobody loved in the world. They don't love you. They don't care anything about you in the world system. They'll use you and abuse you and just throw you in the dumpster. And I started looking back at my life. And I remember when I got saved, you know, I remember I said, look, all the years I wasted pursuing the world dreams. You know, and right when I got saved, Virgin Records ready to sign a record deal. A week later after I get saved, imagine all this money daggling at you like this. Here's a couple million dollars. You could, you could just sing. And then they told me, oh, you can be a Christian and sing R&B if you want to. I said, that's just nonsense. I said, I'm living for the Lord. I can't do it. I walked away from all that money. And little did I know, I walked away from a death trap. And I said, to live as Christ, to die as gain. Keep your money. And so the world could never offer you the beauty of Christ, the beauty of our precious Savior. And some people just work. I'm going to make it. I got to get this. I got the world. I need this. I got to have this. And this vicious cycle of just going after this and going, oh, we need another house in the mountains. We need another this. We need another. That's a vicious cycle. It's perpetual dissatisfaction with no earthly relief. It's like a dog chasing his own tail, and he runs around in circles, and then when he catches it, who barks the loudest, and he lets it go at the same time? <laughs> you know? 
And Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, the world's ways of saying success and, you know, the path of fame and wealth and pleasure and power. And, you know, the world says, look out for number one. That's who you look out for. Because for the believer, we look out for other people. We have a heart for other people. God gives us a heart and press upon our hearts to care for other people or to care for the needs of other people. You know, I remember this guy came to church a few weeks ago. He didn't have a coat. And as an elderly guy, I don't know, maybe in his 60s. I don't know if that's elderly anymore, but he's over 60, I'm sure. And he looked, us, looked at one of the guys and said, I need a coat. I don't have a coat. I only got a windbreak and it's getting ready to get cold. And, and I remember we got him a coat and he came to church and stood before us and just cried. He said, nobody never cared about me. Nobody don't care nothing about me. I live in a shelter. I've been in a shelter for two years. Nobody could care any, they could care less about me. And you guys got me a coat, and not a used coat, a brand new coat. And he looked at me and he just started crying, a grown man. I remember we did a flea market once about four years ago, and we used to do furniture sometime at the flea markets, but all the furniture went to elderly people first. So they had first dibs. But they could say what they want, and we said, the seniors get it first. And I remember, remember this lady coming and saying, you know what, you know, I want the kitchen set right there. We said, it's yours, it's yours. She said, really? I said, she said, well, how much? I said, no catch, it's yours. We get her the kitchen set. She said, I don't know. She said, I got one more problem. She said, I don't know. I'm going to get it home. I said, you see that big U-Haul over there? We do delivery on the spot. And we delivered it up to the high rise, and we got it. She said, I haven't had a, a, a kitchen set in eight years. Eight years. And, and you see that, and you start saying, how in the world do I want to be conformed to this world? The world won't do nothing for anybody. It's only the body of Christ that can change this dark and dusty, dirty world. Only us. Only us. God will use us to be the ones that turn the world upside down. And Paul says, be ye not conformed to this world, because this world is vicious. But he says, be transformed. I like the King James says, be ye transformed. Keep on being transformed. The word transform is where it's metamorpho. We get the word metamorphosis, where, you know, you see the, the, the caterpillar go through the cocoon and become a butterfly. That, you know, that it means to be metamorphosized, to be changed. It's the same word used when Peter, James, and John was with Christ in Matthew chapter 17, verse 2, Mark 9, 2, Luke 9, 29, when Christ was transfigured right before them. It's the same word, metamorphosized, right in front of their eyes. Can you imagine being in a prayer meeting, praying with somebody, you turn around, they be a light bulb next to you? <laughs> this is what happened to them, you know? Luke tells us that his face was altered. Mark tells us that his clothes were whiter than any launderer could actually get them. And so our lives should be those lives that are transformed, that we're like lights, that we let our light so shine before men that they would see, you know, our good deeds and good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. That we should be the transformers, you know. What are you? A transformer. Be ye transformed. You know, you can only be transformed when you're not conformed to this world. That's the only way you could ever be transformed. When you don't live by the world system. Jesus said he was from another world. They looked at him like he was weird. We're just passing through. Don't wear the garments of this world too tight because we're just sojourners and pilgrims passing through. So he says, be ye not transformed. He says, but be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Because Paul was the one, when you think about Paul, think about Paul's life. If you want to know what it means to be a sold out Christian, study the life of Paul. Paul meets Christ on the road of Damascus in Acts chapter 9. He says, Lord, what would you have me do? You know, he just said, automatically, I want to serve you. You know, the Lord said, I'll show you how many things you'll suffer for my name's sake and so forth. And Paul's life, he was said, I'm ready to serve. He never looked back. Even when he was arrested, could you imagine being arrested with Paul? You know, he always thought that Rome was chained to him, not that he was chained to Rome. 
You imagine you one of those quadrant, one of those guards, and Paul chained to you all day long, all you hear, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And you're like, this nut, I don't want to work with him. You know, tomorrow, who you work with tomorrow? Paul, I don't want to work with him tomorrow. I'm calling out sick. <laughs> you know, all of them would have heard the gospel every day over and over and over again. And Paul was the one, his life was transformed. His life was not conformed to this world, but his life was transformed. Because he's, he's the one that says, I was crucified with Christ. It is not I who live, but Christ lives through me in a life that I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. And he says, who gave himself for me? Paul never forgot that. He says, to live is Christ, to die is gain. He says, I don't wish your life, Paul. I don't have a life. It's hidden in Christ. He said, I'm not only conformed, I'm transformed. Because I will never go back to this world. He says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. If the word renewing is the word, is only twice in the New Testament. Anakinosis is found here in this verse, and it's found in Titus 3, 5, when Titus says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, God's mercy, he saved us, you know, through the washing of regeneration and the renewing, the anakinosis, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. That God renewed us. We're not old. We're new. If any man be in Christ or woman, he's a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Consider, they all become new. I'm not the old, you know, dirty, dusty sinner I was. I'm washed in the blood of Christ. And you are too, if you know Jesus. And you don't have to go back to the old life. The old life wore us down. It wore us down. We were worn down. You know, oh, you're going to the party tonight? But Satan never reminds you of all the headaches you had when you was hungover and all that stuff. He never reminds you of that. He just tells you how much fun you're going to have. And here he says, by the renewing of your mind, that your mind is a terrible thing to waste. Yes, it is. But a wonderful thing to renew. It's a wonderful thing to renew by sitting alone with God and his word. He says, how can a young man cleanse his way except by taking heed to the word of God, the word that I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee? The word that I've kept. And Jesus, sanctify them by thy word. Thy word is truth. His word is truth. And because we have the word, we can live lives set aside from the world. I love that. I don't have to go back and try to be, you know, could you imagine, I'm 51, imagine me trying to be cool with an earring in my ear and a hat on, talking about, oh, you need Jesus. You know, it would be a shame. <laughs> so look at that old bald head man, you know. <laughs> he says, by the renewing of your mind that you may prove and examine or test out to completion, the word prove me, what is that good 27 times in the book of Romans, Paul uses the word good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You want to know the will of God? Most of us do want to know the will of God. He says, live a surrendered life. Don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You'll learn my will. Wherever I take you, you just follow. He said, Lord, I don't know where you're taking me. Great, I don't need to know where you're taking me. Just follow. He told Abraham, get out of your land and your country and your family and, you know, out of the land of the Ur of the Chaldeans and go to a place you know not of. And that builder and that maker of that city was God. Abraham didn't know where he was going, but by faith, he followed. We're so interested in the blueprint. God don't give blueprints. He give footsteps. <laughs> follow me. Can you imagine when he comes to, you know, and James and John in the boat with their father, a successful businessman, fisherman, and Jesus walks up to them, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. We would have said, what? No, get out. My father's the CEO of Zebedee Fish Company. I'm not leaving nowhere. <laughs> we wouldn't have left. We said, no way. They left their nets and they followed the Lord because they're willing to lay down their lives. And they didn't know what it all meant. They didn't know anything. They just followed the Lord. And that's all we need to do. We don't have to know what it seems like. 
You know, we went to North Philly. I didn't have a clue. What, could you imagine a Calvary Chapel in the heart of North Philly? Could you imagine that? Y'all have live musicians. We don't have live musicians. We do digital music. You know, we put up chairs every Sunday. We got this big screen. It's like almost like a big, I don't know, pyramid going up. And these guys put this big screen up every Sunday, and the chairs getting broke down. We meet in a YMCA gym. You know, I'm looking at this gym. I said, this is a miracle that the Y even let us in here. This is a miracle. Our midweek service is in a charter school. And they called us the other day and said, you know what? Write down a list of the things y'all want to do here. We want y'all to do whatever y'all want to do. I say, Lord, what? All right. It's a miracle after miracle I'm witnessing in serving the Lord and just following him. I don't know what to expect. I don't, know, I don't care what to expect. I just want to follow him. And do I understand it? I don't want to understand it. It says, trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not towards your own understanding. And in all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Plural. So God knows what he's doing. And to live a surrendered life, you got to come into a place where you say, Lord, I don't have, I bring nothing to the table but myself, Lord. Remember that old hymn that was written by a man named Judson W. Um, Van um, Deviner in 1896. Um, he wrote a hymn it's entitled, um, titled, um, I Surrender All. And it, I love the words. It says, all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love him and trust him in his presence daily live. All to Jesus I surrender, humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken, take me, Jesus, take me now. All to Jesus I surrender, make me Savior holy thine. Let me fill the, the Holy Spirit, tr tr truly know that thine are mine. All to Jesus I surrender, Lord, I give myself to thee. Fill me with thy love and power. Let thy blessing fall on me. All to Jesus I surrender, now I fill the sacred flame. Oh, the joy of full salvation. Glory, glory to his name. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. I'm yours, Lord. We sing these hymns, and I love these hymns. I've known some of them since a kid. But when it comes to surrender, I don't know. Lord, that part of my life, yes, I want it all. Anything that looks like the world, I don't want you to look like it. Anything, Lord, yes. Because I want you to myself. I love you, and I care for you. And I know the thoughts I have towards you. They're good and not evil. I don't want you to go in bondage. Being yoked up with the world system. You know, you wasn't saved in the spirit and now you're going to be made perfected in the flesh. God says, God forbid, no way. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God which is our reasonable service, and be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, metamorphosized, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You want to know the will of God for your life? You go home and you memorize these verses and say, Lord, I want to practice them in my life daily. I don't just want to know you, Paul said, that I might know you in the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your suffering and being conformed into your death, that I might know you experientially, not just know you with head knowledge, know you with heart action that I'm willing to follow. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for who you are, Lord. We thank you for your goodness, your grace, your kindness, Lord. Lord, you are so good to us, Lord. You've been faithful to us, Lord. Even when we're faithless, you remain faithful because you can't deny yourself, Lord. And so, Lord, we pray, Lord, that you pour out your spirit upon us, Lord. We, well, Lord, we want revival in these last days, Lord. We want to see you do something, Lord, that is supernatural. But, Lord, let us have our lives, Lord, empty of ourselves, Lord. That we would be filled with the spirit in such a way, Lord 
that we could hear your voice so clear, Lord. Lord, as Elijah just heard that still, quiet voice, Lord, that we could hear you tell us, you want us unto yourself. Lord, let us gather together as the body of Christ in these days, Lord, that we gather closer together, that we fall in love with one another, Lord. You said the world would know that we're your disciples because of our love one for another, Lord. And so, Father, I pray, draw us near to you, Lord. You said as we draw near to you, you would draw near to us. And, Father, we don't want our hands to touch anything, Lord, apart from it being you leading us, Lord. Lord, let us be like those who waited on the tables, who were filled with the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom, Lord. Lord, let us be those, Lord, who not only live a life that pleases you, Lord, but a life that is surrendered unto you, Lord. So, Father, I pray you bless us and keep us. And strengthen us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Please stand.